These mitochondria that we learned about as power plants of the cells that are making energy are doing so much more than that. They're not only making the energy, but they're deciding where the energy goes. So there's a lot of signaling that's going on. And they're literally taking in this information from the environment and they're saying, okay, am I safe? I, I, am I not safe? When we are stressed in our macro life, mm -hmm. right, every day and we feel it and we know how we act with stress, are our cells in the micro life mirroring yeah. what's going on? Yes. So the craziest thing I learned about, you know, cellular health was that these mitochondria that we learned about as power plants of the cells that are making energy are doing so much more than that. They're not only making the energy, but they're deciding where the energy goes. So there's a lot of signaling that's going on. And they're literally taking in this information from the environment and they're saying, okay, am I safe? I, I, am I not safe? And if they sense that there's unsafety or they sense that there's a lot of stress on the environment, they're gonna say, okay, I, I help produce stress hormones. Like literally mitochondria help produce cortisol. And then they also help produce um, epinephrine and norepinephrine. But they also help produce sex hormones. And so turns out that if there's too much stress in the body system, it's gonna say, mm, reproduction is not really my priority right now. We're gonna take care of survival. And it will actually shift the body's metabolism to more of what's called the cell danger response, which is I'm gonna hold on to every single calorie that I get, and I'm going to make sure that I survive. And I'm gonna make every cell a little bit more insulin resistant because I wanna make sure that there's fuel for the brain. And so it's really unfortunate because it's honestly like, Chronic stress was not really supposed to be our lives. Like our genetics are not designed for chronic stress. So we live in these chronically stressful lives. And then if we're not careful, that chronic stress can really drain your energy. It's almost like your, your mitochondria are like batteries or capacitors and they will, their capacity will go down if you use, use, the, use them up for stress. And when that happens, your immune system doesn't necessarily have enough energy to mount a response and your alarm systems that are supposed to go off when a pathogen comes into the cell, if there's not enough energy to mount that alarm response, then those infections can go right inside the cell, hijack your own metabolic machinery, and actually drain your energy further and really break the system. And this is part of why I think chronic fatigue emerges. And there's a great book on chronic fatigue called um, Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, It's Mitochondria, Not Hypochondria. Wow. And it's literally by this Dr. Amy Myhill out in England. She wrote this great book. And it totally transformed my perspective on um, this disease that we thought was a psychosomatic condition. And I was like seeing patients with chronic fatigue and they were not making it up. They were suffering. And they were like, what do I do? And I was like, well, let me go figure this out for you. And then the thing that I figured out was that, whoa, they've got, they've got a lot of intracellular infections. They had multiple hidden infections that no doctor was testing for. And then I'm like, whoa, whoa, these people need some serious healing. But the other thing I realized is that they all had something in common, which was that they got chronic fatigue after massively being stressed out and then having like a PTSD level stressor. So it was like their bodies were under a chronic, chronic stress. And then they, so the stress cup was already to the brink and then a major life stressor happened and then it overflowed and it broke their system. And then those infections get inside the cell and then they are thriving while well, you're miserable. And this is why chronic COVID happens. And this is why like chronic COVID has such widespread symptoms of, it's like global energy deficiency across the body. So you see brain symptoms, you see nervous system symptoms, you see heart symptoms, and you see, you know, muscle symptoms and fatigue symptoms. And it's like, everyone's like, we don't understand, we don't understand chronic COVID. I'm like, it's chronic fatigue, guys. Mm -hmm. It's not rocket science. Mm -hmm. And yet a lot of people don't know that there's options for, you know, dealing with, mitochondrial dysfunction. It takes a real, I mean, ideally you want to catch it early. Um, I, I got COVID after Burning Man and I went and did, during COVID, I did ozone, which I think, I don't know if you've ever done like 10 pass ozone, but mm. it went, I mean, my blood went from like dark to light. It was so crazy. It was so oxygenated. Yeah. And I felt like immediately, immediate improvement in the muscle pain when I did this. And it was like, pain is often, especially muscle pain during infection, is often a reflection of this energy deficiency that happens when you're in, in, enduring an infection and the inflammation as well. So that helped a lot. And then I was still feeling a bit lower energy after the infection and I went and I did NAD therapy. Yeah. Oh my God, I thought, I was so skeptical, but I was so like, I just need to try anything. And one of my friends said, 
you just try, I did, I did this, it helped me, you should try it. So I went and I did it and I was like, I felt like a new person afterwards. It was crazy how fast I re rebounded. Mm. I mean, I felt like better than I did going into COVID, which was crazy. So I'm, I didn't write about everything that I, I would want to put in the book because some of the things that I've done in the last six months are more cutting edge, like, uh, you know, regenerative medicine. But I do think that what the book is really about is like, you need to have the basics covered to get your energy capacity at a healthy level on a daily consistent basis. And then, you know, if you do get sick and injured or, or sick and, and really broken down, that's when you want to pull in some of the more big, big guns. And like the book wasn't really about chronic disease. It really wasn't about treating chronic COVID, even though I'd mentioned some of this stuff in the book. The book was really about how do you maintain a healthy energy producing lifestyle. And then I'll probably write another book on like how to fix yourself once you're broken. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, the goal for this book is to take people who are generally healthy and get them to be optimally well and stay well so that if they do get hit with a stressor, they can bounce back. So up until now, there haven't been many supplements out there on the market to support mitophagy. This is the flushing out of your old damaged mitochondria. The health of your mitochondria is essential to the health of your overall being. Mitochondria is not only helping produce and create energy in the body, but poor mitochondrial health is connected to aging, chronic diseases like cancer. So when I discovered this compound called urolithin A, I was super intrigued. This was many years ago. I remember reading a study about it when it came to longevity and reducing inflammation in the body. Now it's derived from pomegranate, but it's very hard to eat enough pomegranate to get the scientifically proven therapeutic dose. This is where a product called MitoPure from Timeline Nutrition comes in. They've created three easy and delicious ways to get your daily dose of 500 milligrams of urolithin A, and their product is called MitoPure. My favorite though are the soft gels. They come in a frosted jar that I use everywhere I go. I bring it with me when I went back home or during the holidays. I bring it anytime I travel because for me, it's super powerful, not only supporting mitochondria, I know it's cleaning out the old damaged mitochondria, but also it's supporting my energy. It's different than coffee. You're not having a burst, a peak, and then a valley. It's sustained energy throughout the day. So I take two a day. MitoPure is the first product to offer a precise dose of your lithin A to upgrade your mitochondrial function. Now the benefit to this increase of cellular energy improves not only your overall energy for the day, but also your muscle strength and your endurance, especially if you're working out or nearing or over the age of 30, this is essential. So Timeline is offering 10% off of your first order of MitoPure. Go to timelinenutrition.com slash DRG and use the code DRG to get 10% off of your order. Again, that's Timeline Nutrition, T-I-M-E-L-I-N-E-N-U-T-R-I-T-O-N dot -E -E com slash DRG. You can try their starter pack that has all three formats. Hey everyone, I want to talk about Birch Living. This is a partner that we've been working with for quite some time. Sleep is so important to me, and you know I'm always excited to talk about Birch on the show. It's a premium mattress in a box company and they make mattresses and sleep products that are stylish, comfortable, and environmentally conscious. Their organic, non-toxic mattresses are made right here in the United States. It was important for me to choose a mattress that is made organic, 100%, that is my number one, and utilizing natural materials. Now, I can sleep comfortably knowing that Birch is not giving off any of them harmful off-gassing chemicals that are there for the life of the bed. And Birch mattress is Green Guard Gold certified. That is the standard, knowing that it is being tested for thousands of different chemicals that I can be exposed to that can be harming my health. I've had my Birch natural mattress for about two years, and I love it. What I love most about it is how breathable and cool it is at night, how it supports my pressure points. I feel like I'm sleeping on a cloud. And it's allergen and mildew resistant and made of raw materials straight from nature. So with your Birch mattress, you get a 100 night sleep trial and a 25 year warranty. The best part about it all is that Birch delivers your mattress right to your door free within the United States. And it comes rolled up in a box and super easy for you to use. So visit birchliving.com slash heal thyself and get $400 off your mattress and two free pillows. If you're looking for a mattress for your little ones, also check out the Birch Kids line. Thank you Birch for sponsoring. Go to birchliving.com slash heal thyself to get $400 off of your Birch mattress and two free pillows. And if you're looking for a mattress for your little ones, check out the new Birch Kids line. So when I think about this big picture, we, we have the mitochondria you're saying yeah. is, is basically the capacitor for our body. Yeah. As that's being affected, we're gonna feel 
all around our body, energy low. Yes. And energy is really the marker of health. The more yeah. energy we have to expend, yeah. the, the more health we have. Yep. But what happens is the mitochondria, which is helping for sex hormones, but also stress hormones, mm -hmm. the more stress we are, sex hormones are going down. Yeah. So we're not feeling that like, ooh, I, I feel uh, vitality and, yeah. and, and, and libido going in, yeah. in that flow. And then you're saying when we are in that state, Oh my God, that's when the infections are running rampant. They're having a great time. Oh, that's when they can get in, right? It's like in. a house that's been power, cut, by, cut, cut the power by 50%. And the security system's The down. security system's not working. And like, it's so crazy because like, I was like, where does inflammation come from? And I'm like, whoa, inflammation literally is this, the chain reaction that leads to the inflammasome signaling actually begins a mitochondrial dysfunction. I did not know that. Nobody taught me that in school. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I've learned a lot of things about how to mitigate inflammation, but one of my favorite things is high dose pharmaceutical grade omegas. I mean, it, that, that was one of the saving graces of my, of my year last year was like, because I was under a lot of chronic stress and chronic stress is gonna cause inflammation on its own. But then um, your diet's a really big key piece of inflammation, your environment. Um, and so you really wanna try to like tackle all the things that are gonna lead to energy drains. Diet's big, movement's important. Um, and obviously, like living in a healthy environment is important, but mastering your stress sources of stress, and then really plugging into a community and having deep connection, to me, that is one of the most game-changing facets of longevity that I didn't even know about. I like didn't know how important healthy relationships were to health. I always thought it was about you know stress, movement, mindfulness, you know, and it was always like an inside job. It was like I'm going to do health, like focus on my health. But then I realized that like if we cultivate relationships with other people who are healthy, they rub off on us. If we spend time with our family and our friends and we move around and we actually do like fitness activities with our friends, that's a great way to enhance our lifestyles. Sharing meals with people that you really care about, care about is a great way to make new friends. I regularly do dinner parties and I have everyone bring someone new that's that I don't know. It's, I mean, like a lot of people don't know how to make friends. And a lot of my sickest patients are the most isolated. And I'm thinking to myself, how is it that I wasn't, how did I miss this connection piece? Like why, what is, what is this about? And so when I started really digging into connection, it led me to the science of love. And so a lot of people don't like the word love because they're like, oh, love means so many things to different people. But I'm really speaking about love from the lens of evolutionary biology, which by the way, the Greeks, they, are, they had nailed all different kinds of love. They had names for self-love, for altruistic, unconditional love of religion, of um, literally every facet of romantic love, Eros, Ludus, and like, there's another one, Mania, um, which was like sort of the dopamine of romantic love, the norepinephrine of romantic mm -hmm. love. We'll get into the romantic love. They also had terms for companion love, familial love, and friendship love. But this is all also backed up by evolutionary biology. So we have this thing called the sex drive, right? There's a sex drive, the romantic love drive, and the attachment drive. And these are all intertwined human drives that constitute the concept of love because we, we needed to evolve love in order to survive. And it's likely that we won over other hominids specifically because we evolved the ability to connect. Because when people come together and they connect, they share information, they share resources, they increase the chances of reproduction, right? Like, the last night we were, I threw in a big event and this guy came in, he's like, oh my God, I saw this girl that I had just seen the night before and I asked her out because I had seen her twice. Yeah. Like proximity is a big factor in who you date. Yeah. And so I was like, now when I go around society and I'm, I'm such a nerd, let's get real, probably on the spectrum in some, some way, shape or form. Um, but I'm going around and I'm just looking at humans. I'm like examining people. I'm like, and you go to, you go to like a park and you can literally see love in action because people are sitting close to one another, they're cuddled up, they're touching, they're sharing food, they're playing music, they're, sh they're sharing books, and they're showing people things that they brought. There's like, there's like, there's this, and they're making out, you know? And it's like, there's this clear, beautiful reflection of what love is really about. It's about coming together. It's about unification. It's about sharing. It's about generosity. It's about being um, protective of one another, it turns out. So like, what is, where's the science behind all this? So there's the sex drive, and then that's really driven by estrogen and, and estrogen, progesterone, and, and testosterone, right? The sex hormones. So if somebody is deficient in sex hormones, they're not gonna have as much of a sex drive. Then there's the romantic love drive, right? So when you have sex with someone quite regularly, it starts activating this, this 
motivational response system that's literally designed to get you to addict to this other person. They want Your body wants you to be addicted to them. It wants you to be so connected to them that you don't let them go. And the reason for this is because you basically would be more likely to end up producing a child and rearing that child when you love someone else, right? This is why, you know, when, when two parents really love one another and they get along really well, it's like one of the best things that can happen for a child's mm -hmm. upbringing. It's just, I mean, I, and I understand that not everyone gets this, but I also don't think everybody gets this because, you know, we can talk a lot about like intergenerational attachment issues and, and um, you know, adverse childhood experiences, but let's get back to romantic love. So what does romantic love feel like, right? There's the desire hormone of dopamine. It's, it's the drug of desire. It's the, it's the hormone of significance. It's the hormone of meaning. It makes us make meaning of existence, right? Like we pursue things that are very pleasurable. One of the reasons why society is so dysfunctional right now is because of all the cheap dopamine around. It's not, there's no reward of connection when you're just flipping through your, you're flipping through your iPhone or like gambling or, you know, um, engaging in, in, you know, drug, you know, misuse. You don't get the reward of that human connection that's supposed to come from love, right? Then there's, um, there's norepinephrine, which is like the obsessiveness of love, right? The, I can't, you know, I can't sleep, I can't eat, I just can't stop thinking about this person, I'm obsessed with this person. Now, then there's the serotonin, which is like the happy hormone, the feeling of like comfort, feeling of like, I feel really happy and joyful when I'm with this person. And then after you fall in love with someone, you typically just start developing attachment. And attachment's purpose is to help the parents stay together and also attach to the child because the child would not survive if we didn't attach to it. So oxytocin and vasopressin are really the hormones of attachment and protection. So oxy women are more oxytocin dominant, which means they're more likely to encourage like sort of this sort of social bonds, right? Safety and, and nurturing. And then men are maybe vasopressin dominant. So one of the benefits of masculinity is the protection and the aggression against you know, like in primitive times, invaders, or maybe like defending against, if you're in, if you, let's say you're in Ukraine and you're defending against your country. Yeah. So vasopressin's powerfully important for defense. Um, but these, you know, these, these facets of our neurobiology, really, they influence our entire existence. And the, and the reality is, is that like, our social bonds are important as well, right? They're also driven by oxytocin and vasopressin. We protect the, our friends. We stand up for our friends. We, we, we cuddle with our friends. I mean, I throw, I throw parties where we just biohack in my living room. We play with all my, my like infrared mats yeah. and my acupressure mats and all my biohacking tools. And we just sit around and cuddle and do Theragun. And like, that's, that's a lot of oxytocin happening in that room. Um, so, so social connection is really key. And like, all of this in the positive light is very nourishing, right, for the for humanity. But the negative of love is, all right, so what happens if you can't find, if, if like a guy maybe grew up in an abusive situation, had, maybe was sexually abused as a child, can't find a partner, and go as a and, and guy or a girl goes out and sexually assaults someone, right? So the downside of every facet of love is with without it, there's there's problems. So like romantic love, loss of romantic love, breakups can feel like literally you're going through withdrawal. Like literally you're withdrawal, going through like a physical withdrawal to this other person. And then also, you know, there's stalking, right? So unhealthy love is when there's an imbalance between how a person feels about a person and the other person and they become obsessed and they stalk. And then there's also things like emotional abuse and physical abuse in a romantic relationship, which can happen if you're attached to someone but you can't let them go and they're still hurting you, but you're still there. And then there's things like um, the downsides of divorce, right? Like when two parents break up, it can affect, it's, it's considered an adverse childhood experience because it can affect their development, their neurodevelopment. Although I think we're making big strides in society for co-parenting. I think there's a lot of good examples now of how to do that. Um, but then, you know, you, we have these deep bonds of our families, but then the downside of that is we have loss with grief. When we inevitably we're going to lose our parents, we're going to lose our grandparents, and so you know these these bonds keep us alive for longer when they're healthy. But the downside of love is that we we experience loss, we experience pain, and we experience grief with social connectivity. When you feel connected to a community, you feel super safe and connected and healthy, and you feel like you can you have support and you have nervous system co-regulation when you're having a bad day. Then if you like, maybe like this happened to one of my friends where there was a relationship conflict between him and this girl and he maybe did some things he shouldn't have done and 
what happened was is um, they ostracized him. They just, you're not, you're not part of our group anymore. So ostracism is one of the most painful things a person can go through. It being kicked out of a community happened to two of my guy friends actually this year. Um, so I think if we were taught about the complexities of love and like how this is core programming of being human, we wouldn't see nearly as, as, as many problems in society. But the problem is, is we're all, we're, we get this body as a baby. We, we're, we're raised by parents who have no idea how, to, how, how like life is programmed. They're just doing the best they can. And then they didn't really, most people didn't get parenting classes, right? So now you're like, you're, you're growing up and you're kind of got this body without a, you, there's no owner's manual. Like where's the owner's manual for like how love works? Where the, where's the owner's manual for how am I supposed to feed myself, you know? So a big piece of what I try to write about in the book is like, let's like break health down into its first principles. And then if you understand those basics, like that's the first step to getting healthy is like, you gotta get the basics right. You gotta get your food right. You gotta get your movement right. You gotta get your stress right. And you gotta get your environment right. And you have to get your connection. And if you can, but this, all this stuff, I did not learn in medical school. Right. All this stuff came after. I did, I did design a course in medical school called Physician Heal Thyself evidence-based lifestyle, and we covered a lot of these topics, but we didn't cover them with the first principles approach of like, what's the science behind, under, like what's really the science behind like organismal biology? This all came in the last 10 years of my career. Like I had to learn this through building a practice that was about optimizing health, doing a lot of personalized medical research, working with a bunch of startups that were learning how to create wearable technology to measure health, and then working at Stanford where I got to like collect all my knowledge and put it into a really comprehensive curriculum and that took, so this was not like, I didn't, I didn't always have a healthy, I wasn't always this healthy. Like I had to learn, okay, here's all the reasons why I'm not healthy. And then here's all the ways that I could become healthy. But it took me a long time. And I didn't write this book as like, this is an overnight success book. Like if you read my book, you are going to have ecstatic health tomorrow. I really think we need to get past those kinds of books. Like that doesn't really exist. Like health comes from consistency. Health comes from regular habits and from getting your habits consistent over time, which builds energy like compounding interest. Mm -hmm. Over time. Over and, time. And patience and continuously yeah. feeding that. Yeah. Right? And it's like that account that is just growing. Yeah. And this is why people are like, wow, I've done this for like two months, three months, and I'm feeling completely different. Yeah. Right? And some things have bigger bangs than sure. others. You're like, whoa, I'm working out now. I feel so much better. Oh wow, God, I forgot yeah. about that. Or sleeping early. Or getting more movement in throughout the day. Getting movement throughout the day. So, but but coming back to this community thing. Now, mm -hmm. now I'm with you. I, I, a while ago, maybe maybe a year and a half ago, I did a show on community. Yeah. And I talked about. Uh, I looked into the studies on community and seeing how this is a measurement of health. Sometimes more important than things like smoking. obesity, smoking. Uh, lipids, blood lipids. Sedentary behavior. Sedentary behavior. And I was like, Hypertension. And yeah, hypertension. So then I, I was like, wait, 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 wait a minute. Yeah. Wait a minute. Why isn't this being asked at every one of the first questions every at every medical doctor's visit? appointment? Yeah. Every doctor's appointment. But we're so quick to do the other things without even asking, not even entertaining. Do you feel alone? Do you have social connection? Do you have a confidant? Do you feel supported? Mm -hmm. But inevitably, I keep getting the same question. Okay, here I am living in North Dakota. Here I am living in. Um, the Bismarck. Yeah. How do I find a community? How do I make friends? How do I make friends? Are there, yeah. Is there ways that people can start to? to I mean, when we I were really young, I write a book on making friends. Seriously, because literally, I would been like, I've been asked this question on so many podcasts, and it's not even in my book. But I had to start doing the research to figure this out so that I could answer this question for people. Um, I actually hired a bunch of interns from great universities this summer to read all these books for me. I was surprised at how literal literature was out there on like the topics of friendship and the topics of self-love. Yeah. And, you know, the one most interesting, but there was a lot of information on loneliness. So I was like, okay, let's, let's lean into loneliness for a second. Why do we have loneliness? And everyone's like, there's this loneliness epidemic. And it's like, no, there's a disconnection epidemic and loneliness is a symptom of disconnection. Mm -hmm. And loneliness is actually a primitive hunger signal that's supposed to bring you closer to a tribe. What happens if you don't have a tribe? Now you're looping into loneliness and despair and sadness and depression. And this is definitely a challenge for people because one of the biggest um, things I found in my research was that it's not enough to just teach people how to make friends. You also need to learn, which we're going to get into, but you also, the, the most effective in, um, interventions for loneliness actually involve addressing maladaptive social cognition, which is the brain will start to misinterpret social signals as negative because 
of the isolation that the person's endured. So they'll go out in the world and they'll try to make friends, but they will literally in, interact with people and they will only remember the negative experiences. They won't remember any of the positives and they will perseverate on, well, I said that thing and that person said that and like they must hate me. And it's surprising how in the research, it basically demonstrates that if you want to first address loneliness, you have to address the way that a person is misperceiving their reality. Who knew, you know, like who knew? And the funny thing is, is I think the biggest problem is like people are interacting with people on their phones and they're just, it's like processed food. Like it's not nourishing. Processed social connection isn't nourishing. So then they get into the real world and they're like, well, this isn't giving me a ton of dopamine because I don't, you know, I'm like feeling really uncomfortable and I don't know these people. And so they're, they're like, they don't feel safe and they don't feel like they can let down their guard. And so you, the, the, one of the things that I, I recommend starting with is, well, if you have one friend, you can have 10 friends. So the key is you want to find your most social friend and go to them and say, hey, I would love to meet some of your friends. Can you introduce me to people? Like, just like dating is actually a lot easier if you have other people connect to you. It's easier to make friends if you have someone who's vouching for you socially. So social, a lot of the reasons why people don't let other people into their social groups is because they haven't vetted them. And they want to know that this person's safe and this person's cool and this person's not going to be weird. So you want to have someone else kind of do this for you. And ideally somebody who's hyper social. So one of the things that I did when I moved to Austin was I just was very fortunate and I immediately made friends with some super social people. And they started spreading the word that I'm great and I'm nice and whatever. One of my best friends, I, I, I had played a role in um, helping her, her life transform after she lost her partner. And I just was like, we're not gonna let you, you know, we're not gonna let you hurt yourself. Like she was born, she was borderline suicidal at one point. And so because I had played such a role in her life, she had basically spread this positive rumor across Austin that I'm like a really great friend. Mm. So that really helped me integrate into a community because I already had people who had vouched for me socially. Right. Um, but so just making friends with some, like ideally one friend, the hardest, it's like kind of like people say making money, it's like you got to make a certain pot of gold first and then it's easier to multiply it. Yeah. You know, the same thing with friends is, is that situation. you got to make a few friends, and then it's easier to make more of those, especially if you invite those people over and say, hey, bring people. Like, I do dinner parties, and I'm like, hey, can you bring some friends over? Mm -hmm. It's so much easier to, um, to like, have people do the work for you than to do it. Like, it's, it maybe, I mean, to, for me, entertainment, entertainment comes easily. Not everybody feels comfortable entertaining, but a potluck is a really simple way where you don't have to feel the pressure to cook for everybody. And you just provide a space, yeah. you know? So food and movement are really big ones, right? So group exercise is like one of the best ways to get in shape. It's the best ways to interact with people. Almost every city, if you really, if you do your homework, you're gonna find softball leagues and volleyball leagues. And almost every city, depending on the season, is gonna have sports leagues for adults that are just amateurs. And then there's hobbyist groups. Like one of my friends, she was in a, um, a rose cultivation horticulturist group in San Francisco, and she would like go to the rose garden and, and, the, and she would hang out with other people who liked cultivating plants. So it's ideally to look for people with similar interests to you yeah. and join clubs. And then volunteering is another great way to make friends. Like one of the best ways to just feel better about yourself is to be more generous and to give more. And like I made a commitment this year, one of my New Year's resolutions was like, I want to give more than I get this year. Because I, I feel like I got more than I gave last year, and I, and I was just so busy that I, I wasn't able to give as much. Right. And, I, and, and I'm so much happier when I'm giving than when I'm receiving. You know, like you just, when you just give your time and your, and your resources to others selflessly, like it's surprisingly an incredible mood boost. Yeah. Um, so just, you know, going out of your way for others, you know, just trying to be altruistic, it's surprisingly effective for making friends because people want pe people want to be around people who are nice. Yeah. You know? Yeah, 100%. I, I when I see the uh, clients that come in who are particularly closed up and living in a lot of fear. Yeah. Or the ones who are going through depression or have a history of depression. Yeah. The three things I tell them is you have to give. Yeah. Whether it's one time a day, your words, your time, yes, or something physical to someone once a day. Wow. Right? And, I love this. And it's really powerful because what I find is the more that that opens up space for your heart, love, yes. it also reduces the space of fear, right? Yes. The vulnerability starts moving away. Yeah. And, and people inevitably feel better than just receiving. They're like, oh, I don't know. I've just been giving so many words of effort. I talked to my cousin. I told him that I really see him and he, he's amazing. And I just, I, I thank you, cousin. And I was like, whoa, 
Yeah. Even I said, get that intuition. If you're online at Starbucks and you see some nice shoes in front of you that someone's wearing, go up to them immediately. Don't don't overthink it. Just go, say your words. I love your shoes. They make me feel good. Thank you. Yeah. But the easy way, and even at that, easy way to make friends. Even if you're starting at point zero, you ain't got no friends. You just moved to a new yep. town. Putting yourself out there, like you said, with your heart is going to continuously give you more. The more yeah. you give, the more you end up receiving. But I love yeah. the idea of, I never even thought about it. Who's your most social friend? Yeah. You want to make more friends? Find find the guy or girl who's always like, damn, they're on Instagram. Look at look where they are here, man. Look at that. Yeah. Now they're at this party. Now they're at this dinner because I got some of those on my Instagram. Yeah. And making new friends would be an easy way if you have someone else do the work for you. It's kind of like if you want to get something done, ask a busy person. Yeah. You know, if you want to want to make friends, ask ask a social person. So as the new year begins and you had your end of year work obligations and all your family fun, it's easy to start the new year stress, especially all throughout January. You might feel worn out or lacking motivation. Now, that's definitely not the way to start the new year. So if you're still feeling like you need a holiday from the holidays, here's a good solution. You need to start taking magnesium every night before you go to bed. Now, I use magnesium breakthrough by Bioptimizers. Why? because it's high quality, organic, and has all the different forms of magnesium. So it's bioavailable, I'm feeling it. So if I take any more than two, I'm going to the bathroom because it's that strong for me. Magnesium Breakthrough is super powerful. What I do is I take two before bed, it gets my body in a restful state so I can have a deep sleep. Now, stress overall, especially in this month as you're running around, is going to deplete your magnesium levels. It's one of the first minerals that goes out the window. And magnesium is critical for getting a deep restorative sleep. So the reason Magnesium Breakthrough is so effective is because it's not only organic, okay, but it's a full-spectrum magnesium supplement, as I mentioned. It has seven unique forms of magnesium in each capsule. Most magnesium supplements are really poor quality. Why? One, they're synthetic, right, non-organic, and two, they have really poor quality forms of magnesium, right? One or two of the worst forms, and it's marketed as it being bioavailable, and it's not really doing much for you. Now, when you get all the seven critical forms of magnesium, that's when all that magic is happening. Because pretty much every function in your body is getting upgraded from stress to pain to sleep to inflammation. Even better, by making magnesium breakthrough part of your daily routine, you're gonna feel rested, recharged, and ready to go about the new year. So for an exclusive offer for you, the Heal Thyself listener, go to magbreakthrough.com slash DRG. In addition to the 10% discount you get by using the promo code DRG10, you will unlock a special gift with purchase for a limited time only. So go to magbreakthrough.com slash DRG now to get your gift. And like, it, it was really funny. It's one of the, it's like when you sleep really well and you meet someone who doesn't sleep well, you're like, how do you not understand how to sleep? But like, I forgot how hard it was for me to get good rest even 10 years ago because I was not sleeping well back then. But now I sleep so well that it's like hard for me to go back into that time in my life where I didn't. And the same thing with socialization. Like I worked so hard in the last 10 years to build community that now it's like hard for me to understand. But then I was like the pandemic. That's when I started realizing, oh, this is what it's like to feel disconnected. Because there was a good nine months where I was not interacting with more than maybe 10 people. And I felt so... It was mostly my family and like a few few people that yeah, I, I yeah. knew in the towns I was living yeah. in. And at one point that got down to like three to four people. And I, I've never been so disconnected in my life. And I remember thinking this, I knew what it was like for my brain to be malfunctioning. I could see it. My friends are like on video. We're like, Molly, remember when you were like kind of losing it during the pandemic? <laughs> it's like, yeah, right? Like I was talking I to birds. I was like going on my walk and like, hey guys, check out all my friends that are birds. Like <laughs> I literally had no friends in the city I was living in and I was hanging out on these nature walks, just like sitting in like a little field, like staring at birds being like, you guys are my friends. Like, it was so fucking bizarre. Sorry yeah. to cuss. Also connecting back to nature, though. But I did. I mean, nature was, for me and one of my sisters, I think it was our saving saving right. grace for the pandemic. Like, right. she got really into nature hikes, going in deep into the woods. And she's like, Molly, I think nature, he nature healed me, you know? And it was, like, the coolest thing to hear that. I was just in um, Puerto Rico with some friends. And, oh, my God, the rainforest is on unbelievably healing yeah. to be surrounded by that much plant matter. And it's not just plants. It's like they're they're alive and they're everything, talking. Everything, everything. You they tune are, in, you'll hear it. They are literally like, it's like a legion. It's like an army of plants around you. And they are so, like, 
some of these fields, you look at it from the distance and you go deep into the field and you're like, I can't even walk through this field. There's so much density of plants that I, there's no way I could actually move through this. It's just that. nuts. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's wild how powerful nature can be. And then we live in these cities and we forget that, you know, we disconnect from that. And we're like, what, where, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking about, yeah, living in the cities, a contrast with nature, how healing nature can be. This is why I always tell people, listen, if you're in the city, you got to find the time at least once a week to be in nature. Mm -hmm. Forest bathe, you got to mm -hmm. be in there. Mm -hmm. But you said something really interesting. We have processed social connection. Yeah. This is the phone. All of us are going, you know what? Like, I haven't seen my family in a while, but listen, I, I talk to him on Instagram. We DM sometimes or we text sometimes. We're all on the WhatsApp what what is what is that doing to our body? What is it giving us false? Is it is it over over expressing dopamine in our body? Are we have we having too much dopamine? Is it is, I, are I we think, having too little? What's happening? I think it's causing some imbalances with what we're supposed to really. I think it's almost like this is what I think is hypothetically happening. I, I need to back this up with some science because somebody should do this research. But we're supposed to be touching people, we're supposed to be hugging people, we're supposed to be, when I was on vacation with my family, we, I was holding my nieces, my dad was holding my nieces, like we were all on the couch cuddling together, my, my niece was playing with my hair, like my sisters and I were sitting outside, like drinking a glass of wine together, we don't, I don't really drink, but with my family on vacation I'll have like a glass of wine, and there was just this deep sense of nervous system calm, that I, and we weren't, we weren't really on television a lot, we weren't on our phones a lot, it was like we were present. And we were, and our nervous systems could co. It was it, there's a there's an attunement that happens when you're present with someone, and you read their body language, and you're picking up on all sorts of communication that's not verbal. Right. And when you can only see a part of a person on a screen, you're missing a lot of information. So there's just like there's that facet of it, which is like you're not you're miss, There's there can be missed signals, mix and mix signals, but then the big one is is like we're supposed to feel the anticipation of seeing someone that we care about, and then the reward of the connection of that person and that oxytocin and that safety and that sense of, like when I hang out with my parents and their dogs greet me every morning and I'm snuggling those dogs, it's not the same as seeing the dogs on a camera. It's like touching and feeling and, and, and like cuddling and holding is gonna release a lot more oxytocin than just talking on the phone. It's just, neurobiology, how it works. Like the best way to get oxytocin, massage, cuddling, if you're in a romantic relationship, orgasm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I was a kid to soothe my sister when she was scared before we went to sleep, I would like tickle her back, you know, like that's very much gonna induce an oxytocin response. And, um, and just like I remember one of my earliest memories of my mother as a baby, like a small child was like just like sitting in her lap and nuzzling her neck. That's where you get oxytocin from these close touching relationships, these closeness. Mm -hmm. And just like, and also, I mean, yes, of course you get some from when someone says some really nice things to you on the phone, you're gonna feel oxytocin, you're gonna get some, but you're probably not gonna get nearly the same amount as if you're like really present in a person with that person. I see. I just think it's, I think there's only so much you can get through a screen. Mm. And the oxytocin is the connection hormone it's right It's the there. connection hormone, okay. yeah. Okay. It's the hormone of, of trust, it's a hormone of safety. It's a hormone of nurturance, and it's a hormone of attachment. It's also the hormone that contributes to the orgasm and then the pair bond of the parents, the um, birthing process. You can't have a birth baby without oxytocin. That's Go why they give putocin. Mm -hmm. And then um, breastfeeding. And then literally when parents are attuning their emotional state to their child through limbic resonance of like, address when a child's having a fit and you come to the child and you're like, Hey, how's it going? What's wrong? And you're like baby talking with a, yeah. with a baby, yeah. with a kid. That's releasing oxytocin. And that's actually training their nervous system to learn how to re react in social situations. I see. When parents put a screen in front of a child, they're not learning that attunement. They're learning that I'm going to self-regulate my emotional state with a screen. And we have a generation of children growing up with this kind of, this kind of rearing. And I think it's causing so much mental illness in children. I think it's causing a lot of um, unnecessary stress in children's lives because they don't know how to handle their emotions. And I think that's contributing to the metabolic dysfunction. I just wrote a paper on the intersection between mental health and, phys and metabolic health. And it was finished before I read the book Brain Energy by Christopher Palmer. And I was like, 
well, he was clearly ahead of me, but he fills in all these gaps in his book. Like my book's really great primer on mitochondrial health, but his book goes into the mental health facets. But what we're learning is that there's a common pathway of a lot of chronic diseases of modernity, and it's metabolic and mental health and the intersection between the nervous system and the metabolism. And it's, I think, mediated through the mitochondria. Wow. The yeah. meeting place again. The meeting place. The full circle. Yeah. It's so interesting to hear that about children. You know, I heard someone talking, uh, who was it? My, oh, my friend, he's a young daughter. And he's like, man, I, I take the phone from her after just like one show or something, and she freaks out. Like, complete dysregulation, and then if she gets it back, Mm -hmm. And back, the nervous system learns to regulate, like you said, attunement to the screen. This is what, how we're building nervous system regulation for children. So imagine now these children 20 years from now when they're adults. And now we've got AI and we got all sorts. I mean, I, I think AI could potentially help solve these problems or cause further problems. We don't really know what's going to happen. But um, yeah, we are heading into a, I mean, we we're, the funny thing about life right now to me is it feels, my life feels like a movie and like a sitcom. Like it's some days are like a sitcom where there's like silly stuff happening. Some days I feel like I'm in a full on movie and it's like I'm in the future and like and like there's so much change in society happening and there's so much global unrest and there's so many dynamic social changes happening in multiple countries all at once. And it feels like we're heading into what could end up being the golden age of humanity, yeah. but we have to get through this really chaotic period of time. And I want to be a part of hopefully the solution of teaching people about really how our bodies are working and what's really going on under the surface so that we can course correct. Because I think if we continue down this path of technology, kind of parent, technological parenting, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause a lot of problems. And it's going to cause a lot of, I mean, one of the biggest things we, we, we should really dig into at some point is this idea of attachment dysfunction, attachment disturbances. And an insecure attachment is when someone becomes anxious or avoidant or disorganized in their adult relationships as a result of their relationships with their parents growing up. Yeah. So imagine if your parent doesn't pay attention to you and you get really worked up emotionally, but they never respond. And so they give you the screen and you learn that the only way that you can regulate is to regulate yourself with technology. You can see how this person could become avoidant to other people's love, right? Well, my parent didn't, didn't serve up for me, didn't, didn't attune their nervous system to me. They were turned off, they handed me this thing. So now when someone tries to get, reach me when I'm struggling, I turn off and go into my phone. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and then what happens is that person grows up that way, maybe they have a child, and then what do they learn? That's how I was raised, that's how I'm gonna raise my kid. Right. And it's, th this, is a, this is the thing, longevity is like largely maybe 10 to 20% genetics. It's probably more so nurture than nature. And we need to recognize that because it's malleable, but we have to examine the ways that we're designing society and the ways that we're thinking about work and the ways that we're thinking about how people, um, you know, like how people reproduce. Yeah, yeah, and, and what we do with our children. And it's, what we do with our kids. And that brings me to like, under, so for me, the approach, approach that I take with these attachments is that that's the way we protect ourselves from the emotions that are unfelt or unlovable. Yeah. Right? right when they're coming up, oh no, I'm gonna go right to this avoidance or right to this attachment. And you see that all the time, but now we're adding another layer with the, with the phones and children, right? Yeah. So wow, mom won't pay attention to me, I feel sad or I feel angry, let me attune to this device that I'm given. Yeah. And then continuously, that's, that's perpetuated through life, Imagine in relationships, that kid in 10, 15 years, right? In marriage, if, if they're getting married, these are all things that we have to start thinking about now. Yeah. And, and it's a great question you raise and concern you raise because it's like, we could be going into a golden age or we could have a big issue in our hands. Oh yeah. This is especially the way society is designed. So, but thinking about back, love. Yeah. Coming back to that, right? Yeah. The, the, the things to do, even in this technological age, the things that we can do, Yeah. community, physical touch. Meals together. Meals together. Which is, Zach Bush was here talking mm -hmm. so, he was stressing so much, sit down and have a meal with your family. And take a pause before you eat and just become present. And like bless your meal, whether you're religious or not. Mm -hmm. Just take a moment to just like, like be grateful for what you have to eat, you know? Slowing down, we're, let's return to some of these practices of our, of our grandparents that we should never have thrown out. Right. You know, I, I grew up in a family that basically was required to have meals together. 
Like you, you didn't, you just couldn't miss a meal. Like it's yeah. not, like dinner was with everyone every night. And that wasn't, you weren't allowed to not show up. That's good. Unless you maybe had something going on and you, like a school practice or something. But like generally speaking, you had to be there. And now whenever I visit my family, you know, meals are a big part of our socialization. They're a big part of our community rituals. You know, we have these, when we go on vacation um, together as a big group, we cook these beautiful meals together. And like, that's, this is, these are some of my best memories. Yeah. But I get that not everybody has that. But at least in our family, like, we haven't always been super strong. There's been ups and downs. But there's been this consistency of like, we're going to repair whatever breaks. We're just going to fix it. We're gonna. We're, there's no. There's no like. We're, there's no like breaking apart, and that was something that was really unique to my upbringing. And I don't think every parent gets that kind of teaching. But there was kind of like this uh, mantra that like divorce is not in our, not in our vocabulary. Mm-hmm. I understand that's definitely not the case for most families, but um, it was an interesting. I mean, it was. I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up not in California. I didn't grow up in the coasts. I, I grew up in a very central Illinois town. It was very much the culture and. Um, I'm definitely far more open-minded about, you know, alternative relationships and family styles and blended families. Like, I'm certainly, I think that at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter um, what your family looks like or what your relationships look like as long as you are continuously working towards creating more connection and right. love and, and, like, really working through problems and learning forgiveness and learning some of these some of these things that we like were taught in religious classes are actually totally agnostic to religion. Like mm-hmm. forgiveness, there's research behind it. Gratitude, research behind it. Prayer, research behind it. Yeah. Whether you believe in God, like prayer is a pro- profound way to soothe your your nervous system. Mm-hmm. Um, I do meditation. You don't have to be religious to meditate. Like a lot of these things that are, that are like, and interestingly, all the research on spirituality, one of the biggest factors that they find that's consistent is community. It's connection. So like what we need to figure out is like how do we create deeper connections, right? Like how do we teach deeper connections? And real quick big question is should we all be returning to work? You know, should people be returning to offices? Like should we be doing like the dual work week where we're in the office sometimes and we're out of office sometimes? Because it's possible that that human interaction at work is if if we have good relationships at work, nourishing for the nervous system. Right. You know? Right. That's a good question because we don't really know. You know, after the pandemic, people were like, oh, this is such a luxury. I don't have to, I can do this in my sweatpants, you know? Yep. And then we think about how powerful, I didn't even think about it, how powerful going into work. Wow, I have two friends at work, but it's nourishing when I see them because I'm yeah. always cracking up with this one and I'm always having a good conversation with this one. Yeah. And looking forward to that is really yeah. important. At the tail end of this, I want to explore this. And we talked about oxytocin a little bit. Sure. And you mentioned orgasm before. Yeah. Now, a lot of people will DM me in their relationships and they go, there's no intimacy. Yeah. Lots of lack of intimacy. Yeah. Lack of presence. Um, what are the implications? What happens when there's the disconnect, lack of presence in a relationship, and then libido goes down, sex goes down? Is there more distance? What's going on hormonally? Mm-hmm. Is there more resentment? Mm-hmm. Is this causing most of the fights? Is it not about the dishes or the trash? What's going on? No, it's not usually. I mean... So disconnect, I mean, relationship problems is one of the biggest factors in sexual dysfunction. And I think a lot of people um, are hesitant to want to bring up challenging, conflicting topics because they're afraid of reactions, they're afraid of rejection, they're afraid of, they're afraid of the conflict, right? But, um, I mean, this is part of the reason why I really am both an advocate and also like an important educator in the psychedelic movement because I think that psychedelics have a role in enhancing human intimacy and connection when they're used properly. And I think that we're going to see in our lifetime, like psychedelic assisted couples therapy, it will return. It's already happening in, in California. There's clinics all over, uh, all over um, LA that are not that many, but there's a few that are offering ketamine assisted couples therapy. Wow. And this is low dose therapy, like not, not a high dose. It's a low dose, low dose. But um, I think first and foremost, you know, people, maybe don't realize the importance of communication on a consistent basis. So if you're not communicating, then the, like, the, the first step to physical intimacy is emotional intimacy, right? That's kind of how courtship works. But people stop the courtship once they're in the relationship and they forget that, that you need to continuously court your partner and you need to continuously rediscover your partner and you need to recognize there's always going to be mystery behind your partner. There's always going to be parts of them that you're not going to know. 
but you have to be curious about them and you have to inquire about their life and like you have to ask them about their life and almost like kind of go back into the dating experience. My most successful friends that are married have told me that the, the secret to their marriage working is that they're they're constantly trying to date their partner. They're like they want to court them. They want to they want to make them feel special. Mm-hmm. They give them words of affirmation. They give them quality time. They give them gifts. They give them all the love languages. I mean, this whole idea of like this is my love language and none of them else matter. I don't know. I think there are different rankings of them, of course, but I think they're all important ways of showing love, and also just like this idea that you know, there's still a need for novelty in relationships, but you can find novelty in shared experiences that are novel, right? So you, your partner may not be completely novel, but there's also, um, you know, things that you can do to make things more novel. I've got some friends of mine that are married and they're such an incredible couple. And they, they told me recently about how they had sat down and there was, um, they, they wanted to watch this movie and then the movie wouldn't play. And they're like, we can't get it to play. And so they're like, well, I guess we'll just sit and talk. And they started just sitting and talking because they had nothing better to do. Mm -hmm. And they found that they were able to discover new parts of each other they'd never seen, parts of traumatic experiences that they'd never brought up. Mm -hmm. And they felt closer than ever after sharing and being vulnerable with this partner. And it's like vulnerability is so fundamental to good intimacy. You You have to be willing to open up and show parts of yourself that you're afraid to show. And ideally, learning how to, I mean, I, I have this entire, I mean, I'm gonna be putting out a lot of content this year when this new website comes up for Adamo, but basically um, one of the things that I learned is this technique called imago therapy, and it's it's called mirroring, empathizing, and validating. So it's like you mirror this person's experience that's challenging. Let's say there's something that really comes up in a conversation that's really hard. You say, okay, like, I can notice that like what you're going through is really, really challenging. I can see that this is hard for you. So you're mirroring back, like, you know, it, it, or maybe even do some active listening. Like, am I getting this right? Is this what you're really experiencing? Is this what you mean? And then empathizing. Oh my God, that must be really hard. I mean, how, how does it make you feel? I can imagine that would make me feel this way. And then validating, which is like, you know what? All of those are real concerns that you deserve to have. But the problem is, is that people don't always have these conflict resolution skills. They may not know how to do nonviolent communication, which is not blaming another person for how you feel, but saying, when you do this thing, this is how it makes me feel. And it's like, you're saying, this is how this is my personal experience to your behavior. And it gives them an opportunity to recognize that like, oh, that's the thing that makes me feel hurt, you know? But I had to, I mean, I didn't learn all these skill sets until I started studying love. And I was like, whoa, there are so many great books out there that have like literally figured out a lot of these ways. But I didn't get taught this in school. So a lot of people are just kind of flying blind in relationships. They don't know how to increase intimacy. But like, you know, one of the biggest ways to improve intimacy is to like just start creating more physical connection, like more touch, more hugs, more cuddles, more massage, just more um, more kisses, more affection. Not everybody grew up in an affectionate family. And so sometimes it makes them uncomfortable. But, you know, reading someone's body language, really addressing like how are they, how are they behaving? Maybe they need, maybe they need like a little hug or something. Maybe they need some attention. Um, we forget to do these things because we get stuck in our own inner illusion of our separate self. Right, you right. Know? And and we stay in the ego. Yeah. And then we start, not coincidentally, putting them as the villain. Right? Yeah, the, the, the drama triangles are so common, right? Like, right. But then there's also just the disc, this, there's a lack of embodiment consistently throughout a lot of people's lives with themselves. So one of the things that dramatically improved my personal relationships was I spent a year on self-love, and, and that included working on attachment. And I was like, man, I really gotta work on my relationship to myself. Like, that's what needs the work. When you really develop a deep sense of appreciation for who you are, you stop blaming other people for how you feel because you realize that it's your experience. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, this is how I feel. I'm struggling with who I am, and then I'm making this other, this other person out to be a bad guy. But really, it's like, they're just a mirror to what's actually going on inside here, yeah, you know? Yeah. What powerful information if you listen. If you listen. And you take a look and you go, whoa, okay, I see what's going on here, right? And that's the conscious part in being in a relationship, which is sometimes the hardest part, right? Yeah. Because relationships are the, the trigger. They, you ain't gonna get any more triggers like that. That's a, that's a boot camp, Yep. especially early on, so. And that trigger, the, those triggers are gonna expose, you know, your shadow. And they're gonna, exp- and then you need to be like, hey, shadow, you're welcome here. 
instead of don't, don't, don't talk, don't talk, don't do anything. Right. It's like, no, your shadow actually needs to be part of the conversation. Yeah. Like when I started telling people about like, okay, so when this happens, I react this way. And I need you to know that this is just like, this is a this is what some of the things that will trigger me. Yeah. And I want you to be aware of that in the event that it ever happens. Like yeah. really being honest with yourself about the parts of yourself that you don't want people to see because they're going to see them eventually. Yeah, yeah. They're going to see them. And you, you give them fair warning. You go, hey, I'm be, I, I reacting like this. Sometimes when, I'm, when this happens, I, this is how I show up. Yeah, and, and if that happens, being like, oh my God, I got triggered. Right. And especially if it's being, if having, the, the hardest thing is in the moment you're being triggered and then you're like, wait, how do, I, how do I pause this? And really the only way that I can consistently hack triggers is by meditating more often. Yeah. But when, when I'm traveling and my meditation sometimes falls off the wayside, man, that's when the, this fuse gets shorter. And then, I mean, this is the real life stuff, you know? This is the stuff that is like, the real flex is like when you're in the moment of being triggered, you stop yourself, <laughs> but it's hard when you your nervous system can just like fly off, you know, and it just, it's, and this is the thing about trauma, right? So almost everybody has some form of trauma, whether it's yeah. big trauma, big T or little T. And these painful experiences are just unintegrated memories from our past that our body is remembering on purpose as present moment experience so that we can identify potential situations that we might want to avoid. Yeah. So it's it's normal for you to react or run away from things that scare you because your nervous system says, I don't want to re revisit that. Yeah, it's not safe. That's why triggers can be so challenging, right? Because it's like, oh, this is a memory that needs to be properly put in the long-term memory, but it's stuck in the present memory because I never really dealt with the fact that, you know, I never really dealt with it. Like, let's say, like, you know, the more that you can come, come to terms with the parts of your history that are still in the presence of your nervous system, no, like that you're experiencing as as though they're real now, that's that's there. That that's happened for a reason yeah. because your body wanted you to remember those for your own safety. But the problem is, is that it's like malware running in the back of the brain. Like traumatic memories are like malware. And you know, I, I'd love to learn a little bit about the emotional release that you um, have learned. Like, can you share anything about how you learned this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it, it it's just a matter of. It's an integ integral part. There's different pieces, but re really, it's all about going to the subconscious and yeah. pulling away from the head, right? And most people are always wanting to be here. Mm -hmm. And this this is the way that I frame it: is say, hey, no, this is your protective mechanism. Yeah. This is what protects you. This is where anxiety lives. This is where your OCD lives. Your addictions, yep. right? All the attachments, the people pleasing. So when this is inevitable, at some point in this practice, people we're in our body. They're in their body and. They pull up to their head. I wonder if I'm doing this right. What's going to happen later? I can't yell this out loud. Or I can't let this emotion come out. I, it can't be held by him. It can't be held by the room. All of these things are just protection. Mm. So the issue is we become so blended with protection that we hear statements like, I am anxious. I am an addict. Mm. I am avoidantly attached. I am anxiously attached. The visual I give people is like, there's the door and there's an armored guard. And I'm saying, that's me. And visibly, you see the space, right? The, the, the time to get between. His name's Joe, my name's Christian, right? Yeah. And you go, what's going on with Christian? He's talking crazy right now. But the blending is so deep that I don't see that as protection. I see it as me. So mm. then when we're in our thoughts, in those thought processes, that protection comes up as us. So the more we just, just name it, go, oh, I'm protecting myself. Yeah. It's so much easier to get into the body. Yeah. So this is what we do, and we go through this process. And inevitably, what we do is create the space where the body can unfold. Just like he, it's all I'm. All I do is remove the hand from picking the scab, and we go. Let's just give it a chance. And mm -hmm. if you're scared, let's start picking again. That's okay, because mm -hmm. how you represent and how you present is okay. It's fine. Wow, who can ever tell someone that you are perfect the way you are and however you unfold today is is exactly how you're supposed to? Yeah. It takes all the pressure off. It lets people be in their body, and what happens is. At some point, it starts unfolding. Yeah. And we go, whoa, there's that sadness. Whoa, there's that anger. Oh, my God, there's that shame about sex and sexuality, your femininity. Wow, there you go. There was either cultural or religious mm. connotations that held you back from being who you are. Mm. And when people express that emotion, behind it is the most beautiful part. It's the potency of who they are. They remember it's never left. They remember who they were. They remember the clarity. They remember the unconditional love. They remember the joy. Some people feel gratitude. It just depends on the flavor of person. But my God, to see that re reconnection, right? Yeah. Reconciliation of who they are. It's like, there I am. And I was like, 
it's been years I've felt like this. I'm so clear, I see everything. Oh my God, I know, and now I know, now I remember. Yeah. Those moments, it's like, there you go. There's the heaven that you are. Yeah. There you go, right? So it's been that type of process. So wow. what happens biochemically? I don't know yet. Maybe we'll do some pre and post testing, some electrodes in the head, but we'll see where that unfolds. I mean, I'm so bullish on the subconscious reprogramming, like hypnotherapy, meditation, mm -hmm. psychedelics, somatic experiencing, yeah. you know, somatic therapies, like what you're describing, emotional release technologies. Yeah. They're all operating on... I mean, even like dream work, hypnagogic states, it's like all operating on this level. And this is the level of where the, the mind can change. And it doesn't change intellectually very easily. We can learn a lot of things intellectually, and then when shit hits the fan, it's like that all goes out the door. Yeah, and you know? this is why this is why people are like, I've been talking to a therapist for 10 years, and then I just did one hour, one session, and I've, I've never been felt like this. And it's because... You, exactly what you said. The egoic cognitive mind wants the answers. We want to remember the moment. And now I understand, now I understand myself mm -hmm. versus the body going, hold on. I don't care about your stories. I don't care if you even understand that moment. It only cares. Are you repressing or are you expressing? That's it. Mm. Are you repressing or are you expressing? If you are, it, that's all the body is concerned with. It doesn't even care about your story with yeah. your friend or your dad or this or that. Only if you're allowing yourself to be feeling that emotion. So I think emotion is energy in motion. Yeah. And I think when people block their own energy and motion, they, they, they like block their own emotional response, it's causing resistance to energy flow. On 100%. A, it, it's just like, a, it's like, this is a, this is like a physics thing, right? Yeah. But it's controlled by the mind. Yeah. And the mitochondria are like these little antennas and they're, they're transmitting consciousness throughout every cell. And because electricity, I mean, is information flow, right? And so to me, this is one of the biggest questions in like chronic disease today, which is how do you take a person out of a chronically stressed nervous system where it's like in constant hypervigilance and get them to leave this cell danger response and actually drop into safety, drop into feeling everything and then feeling calm. Like I, I learned that like through you know our mutual friend Anthony Lemmy, like if I can go through, if I'm going through something really intense emotionally, the best thing I can do is like, and I did this over, over um, New Year's, around that, around that time I had dealt with something profoundly challenging. And I went to my room and I shook and I let my body just yeah. shake it out, shake it out, shake it out, shake it out. And then I also have been studying this thing called Kama Mudra, which is kind of like Kama Sutra, but it's like the spiritual approach to bliss. And I was like, okay, I can convert this experience of fear and pain into bliss. So I was tr actively turning these physical convulsions into pleasure. And I, I was like, I was like, whoa, I didn't know I could do that. Yeah. Like, I didn't know I could shake that and turn that, in, that fear into bliss. Like, I didn't know that was possible. Yeah, so my take on that is the fear was the lead blanket that was over the bliss that is you. Yeah. So you just access that part yeah. of you, right? So, yeah. So the, to go back to your question, how do we uh, allow people to come? How do we give people that moment where they can get out of that stressful state? But for me, the way I approach stress is stress is only the response to you not allowing emotion to be mm. expressed. It's That makes a lot of sense to me because when I was told by a friend who's an expert in PTSD, um, I was told that people who aren't people who who have resolved their trauma don't get stressed. Right. Like by by in stress, I mean stressed, so they're like reactively stressed, right? And I was like, well, I guess there's things I need to work on. <laughs> but it's funny because I, I did a lot of um, really cool stress hacking to techniques last year. I did some neurofeedback that was like a new form of neurofeedback called think interfaces. And it's like you play a video game with your brain and it recalibrates your dopamine and norepinephrine. It's wow. crazy. And for somebody who's been, I mean, I, I literally chemically on my um, Dutch test was running low on HVA and um, VMA. Mm -hmm. So I could literally- right at the end, you saw those numbers. I was literally seeing low numbers and I'm like, okay, this is obviously a, like, a consequence of stress. Yeah. And I go and I do this weird brain technology and I'm like, lady, you are literally reprogramming my brain. What is this stuff? And she's like, it's this like new technology, but she's been working on it for a year. She's not even really out in the open about it, but she just got published in, in Nature. And I've been amazed, I mean, I'm so optimistic that with some of these technological and sort of like sort of inner technology techniques that are coming out, like we're going to be able to tackle real mental challenges 
at scale. Yeah, at it's scale. It's coming. It's scale. We're, it's, we're just on the we're just on the forefront. Like for we're sure. like so fortunate that we get to be in the health domain right now. Right now, because there's more available than ever before. A hundred percent. And and this is where it's moving. And and I think that that was the gift, if you want to say, of COVID. Yeah. It completely. It was. There's like a timeline, pre and post, and mm-hmm. after. People are asking more questions and saying, "I don't feel good not being in community. I feel lonely. My mental health. Actually, what else is there? Yeah. You know. And now they're exploring these new ways. But, I mean. That is, for me, the stress. It's like, aside from chemical or physical stress, Mm -hmm. if someone comes home and says, honey, I had a hard day at work. I feel really stressed. Well, why do you feel stressed? What did your boss say to you? Did you not allow that emotion to respond? Did you not allow the anger Mm -hmm. or maybe the grief that came from your boss? Did you hold it and repress that? Because that's what your body's doing. It's in a stressful state because it's utilizing all of its resources to hold in that emotion, which is so much energy. Yeah. When emotion is released, that energy in motion, and you felt as you shaked and then transformed into mm-hmm. that bliss that was, was your potency, it is, it people, it's like sometimes they come out of a sauna, right? Yeah. Imagine how much energy in motion, how much heat energy is being yeah. released. So it's beautiful stuff. I know you're going to come through for the next time you're here. We're I am do, so excited for yeah, this. Yeah, we're going to, let's do a little report. It's like a reward for this book launch. Right, right, right. Because like the funny thing about writing a book on health is that it's really not healthy. It's I, ironically deeply unhealthy to write a book on health. Because it's like you're doing another company at the same time, like you're launching another company. But it's been a dream of mine to always write a book and to be able to help more people than I could help in my practice. Yeah, so the book is called? The Spark Factor. Okay, and where do we get it? You can get it on Amazon, my website, drmolly.co, backslash the spark factor. Um, my Instagram, at, at drmolly.co, please follow me. Yeah, Dr. Molly's been someone I've been following for a long time, from the beginning on the psychedelics, and then you were talking on Clubhouse. I was listening to you every Thursday or Friday, I oh, remember. Oh, yeah, the psychedelic news psychedelic was fun. News. Yeah, so you've always been putting out, t- you're the, you're one of the OGs. I remember you at Stanford. What a gift to have you here two times in a row. Next year, we'll have you three. Yay. It's going to be a, a every year thing, okay? You're a resident on this show, but thank you so much for your knowledge, for your perspectives on love, the biology of love, right? That this is such important information, connecting. The mm. most important thing evolutionarily, connecting with each other, and you're mounting this flag and going, hey, we need more connection. We do. And I'm with it. However I can help, all the love. Thank you so much, Dr. Molly. Thank you so much, Dr. G. All right, everyone, so now, You heard about the physiology of love. What happens in the body when love is unfolding? The neurotransmitters, the hormones. How are we all affected? And let's understand what Dr. Molly was saying is that we are evolutionarily connected to connection. We are evolutionarily connected to the stimulus of what connection does to the body and the signals that it gives our body in safety. That is promoting the healing. You see, you can't do enough biohacks to ever measure what it feels like to be touched and loved by someone you care about, to feel safe in the arms of someone you care about, to feel safe in the home that you're living in. But I want to go into something that we don't think much about. So many people come to me and they go, Doc, I have such issues with vulnerability. There is a wall around my heart and I can't access anything and I never let my partner in. How many people listening right now is this connecting to, resonating with? How many of us suffer with, you know, I, I just my partner, I can't really get through to him or her. There's a wall there. And how many of us are living with the themes that we're, we cannot be vulnerable, we cannot open our hearts? So what happens? Really, what's happening in our lives that has led us in adulthood to manifest in this way? Well, as always, it always happens when we're young. And as always, it always happens with the signals we're given at a young age. What do we see in the connection between mom and dad? Right? Remember, from the ages of one through six, we're developing our connection and definition of what the world means to us. And in this theta brainwave state, we're downloading everything. We're downloading caterpillar, what that means, and cat, what that means, and forest, and trees, and skies, and toy, and dog. Everything is given definition throughout this point of our life. We are like a big downloading human computer, but it's not downloading egoically. We're not cognizing, okay, here is a caterpillar and it moves this way. We see it, we observe it, but it's more the observed state. And it's downloading into our fascia and now we're having a new relationship with it. So this happens at a young age. But most importantly, what we're downloading is our experience at home. Now in the context of vulnerability, in the context of affection, connection, if that's not being modeled and expressed by mom to dad or dad to mom or your parents or whoever raised you, 
If you're not seeing the openness, the words of affirmation, I love you, I care about you, I'm happy. If you're not seeing the affection and the touching, the hugging, the hand-holding, the kissing on the cheek, the kissing on the lips, the hug from behind, if you're not witnessing that, then of course, what's being modeled to you is a different experience of what love and openness and connection and touch means. So very important to understand the signals that we're given at a young age, one through six, are already being defined by us. So when it comes to the age of seven, now our brainwaves are changing and now we're realizing and connecting egoically who is the person I need to be in relation to this experience. So now your stories start beginning. So if you're not seeing mom and dad connect on a deep level, speak to each other with love and respect, you're already getting the inputs that this is what relationship looks like. Even if you're watching movies and it's romantic and you see your friend's parents and it's different, the relationship that is most downloaded, that is most deeply, deeply downloaded in your body is that of mom and dad. So as we get older, those emotions become held back. And of course, when we go into relationships and we start having this experience of the mirroring of relationships, so often we become triggered, right? And if you're anything like me, when I was wounded in this capacity, I know what it means to have a wall around the heart. And how many people, trigger and ask you, I, I want more connection, I want more love, I want more affection, I want more openness, I want more words of affirmation. Now, how many of you out here have trouble crying? How many out here actually wear a medal of honor saying, I don't cry, I haven't cried in 10 years, I don't know, I'm just, I'm not connected to crying. Well, that's not a coincidence. The vulnerability aspect is so important because the more that we contain that part of us that is love, the more we contain also the part of us that is sadness and the more we up level that part of us that is fear. The thing that is holding us back from being our most expressive, loving, words of affirmation, touch, giving selves is fear. So with that said then, fear and love are on opposite sides of the spectrum, both you, both very authentically you, but fear and love are on opposite sides of the spectrum. So as one goes up, one goes down. As one goes down, one goes up. So how do we begin to open up that wall of the heart so we can express more love? Love being everything. How do we express more of who we are? The container that holds all parts of us, that deepest fear and that highest love, the deepest sadness, but the highest joy. It is the container that holds everything, that is love. So showing up in relationship and the capacity of being able to hold your loved one, the most that anyone can ever hold this person, you said, you have permission to be exactly who you are. Without fear, that's love. That's deepest, truest, most unconditional love. So when you hear comments like self-love, you gotta love yourself. Here's this new book that just came out. It's about loving yourself. Or, or even worse, you're at the end of a lecture and they go, so the take home story, just love yourself. What does that even mean, right? It means more specifically, allowing yourself to be who you are, right? Loving yourself is allowing the capacity of all of your emotions without fear. Allowing yourself to express who you are without fear. That is the container of unconditional love that you hold within yourself. You cannot love someone unconditionally if you can't even hold that within yourself. So the work is always you first. Now, I'm gonna give you the first hack. I'm gonna give you the first number one hack to opening your heart and reducing fear to be more authentically you. Check this out. What I want all of you to do, especially if you're living with the story, I don't cry or I have a wall around my heart or I have troubles with vulnerability and I have my partner keep asking me to be more open and be more loving and give more words of affirmation. I'm gonna give you the directions right now. Once a day, listen to your intuition, once a day, I want you, whenever you're called to give a word of affirmation, give it. Let that moment where you feel that inspiration, where that's your intuition talking, let that lead before your ego goes no and starts making excuses that I can't do that, I'm gonna look weird, I'm gonna sound weird, I can't do this. So say for example, you're in line at a coffee shop and someone is standing in front of you and they have these awesome shoes that are aesthetically pleasing to your eye. Go up to them. See, listen how, if, if there's vulnerability just even thinking about that, if you feel awkward, that's shame. There's shame and fear around just you expressing your heart because at some point in your life, you were told that you can't express your heart. At some point in your life when you did express your heart, you were chastised or you were held back or you were told you were too much or too little. Now, here's a moment to heal that. Let your intuition lead. 
give a word of affirmation. Now, why words of affirmation are so powerful is because words are powerful. The more that you say the words that come from the heart and speak it from the heart, not the ego, the more you say the words that come from the heart, the more it begins to open. The more it's given permission to open, the more your body sees you listening to its intuition and honoring it, and the more your body trusts you to give you more intuition. It's a cycle. Your body's waiting for permission, but it needs you to listen. So listen to your intuition, lead with those words of affirmation. If in the moment you're walking in the street and you think about a loved one and you say, ah, I really love how my aunt really showed up for me in 1993. I really should have said something. You know what? Forget it. I'm going to send her a text. I haven't talked to her in so long. I might sound weird. I might be crazy. It's okay. And at the end of the night, when you're in bed, ask yourself, have I given a word of affirmation to someone I love? Have I opened my heart to someone that I love? Aside from words of affirmation, you're also welcome to donate your time, right? What a valuable resource, but donate your time to giving. If you can't see by now, it's all about giving. Donate your time to giving. If you need to give or donate something to someone in need, do that. I don't care what it is. What I care is that the act of giving is coming from the heart, authentically. This is the number one remedy for opening your heart, increasing your capacity to express sadness, and reducing reducing that level of fear that holds you back from expressing your heart that's so deeply needed by not only the people around you, but everyone around you. What a gift that that's accessible right now with this really, really easy practice. Give everyone your heart, open your heart, give more to people, give more words of affirmation. Listen, I know it could be vulnerable, but try it out. I'm with you there, but try it out. Do it for 30 days. Send me a DM and say, hey, Doc G, this is what I noticed. I promise you, your life will be very, very different. All the love, all the joy. Thank you for listening to The Knowledge Bomb. Thank you for listening to the show. I really hope you enjoyed Dr. Molly. If you haven't rated, review, or subscribed to the show, go back and do it. Support the show. That's how we grow. That's how we increase the visibility and give to more people. Heal Thyself merch is out there. Organic, sustainable. HTS.today. Check it out. It's the hottest, healthiest swag out there.